Okay, I think we're going to get started. So, um, uh, to give us a welcome, um, I'd like to welcome our new uh, provost and senior vice president to come up, Carolyn Jinko, um, on behalf of the university. Thanks. Thank you all for, for being here this evening for this wonderful event. Um, for those of you who don't know me, probably most of you don't know me, I'm Caroline Jenko. I'm the, uh, the provost. I wanted to say the vice provost. I'm the provost at Tufts. I've been in this role since January of 2022, so just a few months. But before that, I was the vice provost for research at Tufts. And before that, I was the um, chair of the Department of Immunology in the medical school. And before that, I was at Boston University for 18 years in the Department of Medicine. So I've been in Boston for quite some time. Uh, I am a scientist by training. Uh, I have a PhD in immunology. And um, my area of research is um, infectious diseases. I'm particularly interested in host pathogen interactions as, in it re as it relates to global leadership. I do a lot of work in China. China. A lot of my research is in China, and um, I'm thrilled to be here this evening. Um, I am thrilled to be able to support the IGL. Um, I am getting to meet the board members and very excited to learn more about IGL and um, the program. I've heard wonderful things about this program um, from many of you, um, and I'm really excited to continue to support it and to continue to see it evolve over the next several years. So thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to be here for just to say a few words to you. I'm looking forward to meeting more of you in person and having more dialogues, more one-on-one -on -one dialogues. And I encourage any of you to come and talk to me and tell me about your experiences because that's the only way for me to learn more about the program is through all of you. So thank you again for the opportunity just to say a few words and um, I look forward to tonight's event. Thank you. So, um, uh, I know a lot of you here, but my name is Heather Barry. I'm the Associate Director at the Institute for Global Leadership. And uh, we want to thank you for coming tonight, both those of you who are here in person, and I know we have many people online as well. Um, we wanted to celebrate what Abuzar and Jennifer and their colleagues have done to help the girls of Afghanistan from the Marifat School. It's such a tremendous opportunity. And before we kind of bring them up, we wanted to talk a little bit about the IGL network because that's really how they met. Um, since the Institute began in 1986, a key cornerstone has been to connect theory to practice and to provide transformative experiences for students, opportunities that show how they can have a positive impact on the world no matter their age. So you can see. Jennifer has been out doing a lot of things for many years now, and Abuzar <laughs> is just, just barely graduated from us. Um, through its courses and opportunities, the IJL has built a strong network of alumni and speaker over its history. Uh, we have been graced with the generosity of our alumni and their willingness to engage with students, to share their expertise, and to provide opportunities for the next generation of students. Um, when COVID hit in the spring of 2020 and many students saw their summer plans fall apart, we made an appeal to our alumni for remote opportunities. In about three weeks, we were able to offer more than 50 remote internships from the United Nations Population Fund to Over Zero to a Silicon Valley startup. And these were all across the globe. Um, Two alumni in Palau, one who was the U.S. ambassador, one who was the counsel to the president of Palau, um, put together an eight-week seminar for our students to learn about the geopolitical issues in the region. Um, we also had more than 30 alumni participate in a 13-week seminar on uh, careers and graduate schools to help our students kind of understand and plan for the future. This network was the basis for the appeal as Afghanistan was being overtaken by the Taliban. When I asked Abuzar if he needed anything, he wrote about trying to evacuate the girls from the Marifat School. The appeal went out to the alumni network and more than 60 people wrote in in the first couple of days, offering what they could to help from contacts to funding. It was pretty remarkable. Jennifer was one of those who stepped in immediately and incredibly, <laughs> and she'll share her story shortly. But there were so many at that point, and his needs came up later. 
at one point it looked like the evacuation might go through Tajikistan, as an example. And I reached out to Sarah Lang, who had done a lot of work in that region. She wrote, we just got to Namibia last week and are settling in. I have military contacts at the U.S. Embassy in Dushanabe and Tashkent and have just reached out to a private firm where my husband's mentor now works. My husband is a foreign area officer with the Air Force, also an EPIC alum. So we can speak to those folks and get somewhere if we needed to get clearance for the plane in case anything changes. I'm also speaking to a network of folks on the ground in Dushanabe to locate volunteers that could help receive the girls and potentially house them when they arrive. And that's just one example. She had just moved from the US to Namibia with a young family, and she was ready to jump in to help. Beyond Conflict, an organization founded by a former board member where another alum works was also ready to jump in to help to accept donations when they needed a 501c3 before the foundation was set up. And the list goes on. Phil Torres and his mom, Jane, also a Tufts alum, reached out to their contacts for visas for the girls in Latin America. It would take the rest of the evening to describe the offers that came in. This network is something that we're extremely proud of and extremely fortunate to have. And we thank all the alumni for their caring, outreach, and support for each other and for the IGL. So with that being said, I'd like to invite Alex up. Hi everyone, my name is Alex and I'm the IGL liaison with the Middle East Research Group, which is formerly known as NIMAP. Um, and I'm very excited to be here to present the Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award. So the Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award was established in 1993 to honor the life and legacy of Jean Mayer, the 10th president and first chancellor of Tufts University from 1976 to 1993. A world-renowned nutritionist, Publishing more than 750 scientific papers and 10 books, Jean Mayer advised three U.S. presidents, Nixon, Ford, and Carter, the U.S. Congress, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, the World Health Organization, the United Nations Children Fund, and the U.S. Secretary of State. He helped establish and expand the food stamp, school lunch, and other national and international nutritional programs, and organized the 1969 White House Conference on Food, Nutrition, and Health. In 1966, Dr. Mayer was the first scientist to speak out against the use of herbicides in the Vietnam War. In 1969, he led a mission to war-torn Biafra to assess health and nutrition conditions. In 1970, he organized an international symposium on famine, which produced the first comprehensive document on how nutrition and relief operations should be handled in time of disaster and was the first to suggest that using starvation as a political tool was a violation of human rights and should be outlawed. For his service in World War II, he was awarded 14 decorations, including three Croix de Guerre, de Guerre the Resistance Medal, and the Cross of the Knight of the Legion of Honor. Among his 23 honorary degrees and numerous awards, he was the recipient of the Presidential End Hunger Award and the President's Environment and Conservation Challenge Award. As the 10th president of Tufts University, Dr. Mayer created the nation's first graduate school of nutrition, established New England's only veterinary school and the USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts, and co-founded the Sackler School of Graduate Biomedical Sciences and the Center for Environmental Management. As chair of the New England Board of Higher Education, he created scholarships that enabled non-white South Africans to go to mixed race universities in their own country. Upon his death, the Boston Globe wrote, quote, Mayer moved universities as social institutions in new directions and towards the assumption of larger responsibilities. He saw them as instruments for improving society and the world environment. President Jimmy Carter said, Dr. Mayer's life and productive career have been dedicated to the service of mankind. In this spirit, the Mayer Award seeks to challenge and inspire students and the larger community by bringing to Tufts distinguished scholars and practitioners whose moral courage, personal integrity, and passion for scholarship resonated his dictum that, quote, scholarship, research, and teaching must be dedicated to solving the most pressing problems facing the world. Please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Abuzar for the award. Gary. And Gary as well, and then we will be joined. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you.
Hello, um, my name is Gary Kashyap, and I'm a sophomore studying IR, International Relations and Environmental Studies at Tufts. Um, I'm also part of the South Asian Regional Committee, which is affiliated with the IGL. I'm honored today to be presenting Abu Zar Royesh with the Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award tonight. His work on behalf of the girls at the Marifat School is truly inspiring, and I hope his work can serve as an example to all of us that we can have an impact on making the world a better place for others, no matter how young we are. Abu Zar is originally from Afghanistan and is a graduate of the Marifat School, which was founded by his father, which we will hear more about shortly. He attended Tufts as an undergraduate, graduating in 2016. He is an alumnus of the IGL's EPIC program, participating in the year on the, on the Middle East and North Africa, um, as well as having the support of the Institute for his projects and an internship in his home country. He received the Tufts Presidential Award for Citizenship, Citizenship and Public Service. He co-founded the Bridges Academy, a literacy and leadership training program for at-risk youth in a camp for internally displaced people, or IDPs, in Kabul, Afghanistan. Bridges Academy offered a two-year-long interdisciplinary program which focused on integrating the youth in the camp to, to the larger Kabul community and exposing them to the larger world and opportunities outside the camp. After the completion of the original Bridge Academy program, the project expanded to work with juvenile re rehabilitation centers around Afghanistan and successfully piloted the program in five provinces across the country, Kabul, Kandahar, Khost, Parwan, and Kapisa. After Tufts, he worked as a senior research associate for the Afghanistan Holding Group and as a research assistant with the Stanford Internet Observatory. He has just graduated from Stanford University as, an, as a Knight Hennessy scholar with two master's degrees, one in international policy and one in management science and engineering. He is the co-founder of Sabi Cash, also known as DataServe AI, a startup that seeks to increase access to capital for businesses in developing countries. He is the co-founder and CEO of the 30 Birds Foundation. We honor him this evening with the Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award in recognition of his courageous activism on behalf of the schoolgirls of the Murayford School and in admiration of his in inspirational and humane leadership. I would now like, now like to invite Salomi to present the award, present the next award. Oh. <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Salomi De Prima. I'm a member of this year's EPIC uh, class, Problems Out Passports, and also the IGL liaison for the Women in Internationals Club here at Tufts. I'm delighted to present the to present Jennifer Slendy with the Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award tonight. Her admirable efforts to help the Marifat school girls succeed and thrive despite having to leave their home country is deeply inspiring. Jennifer Slendy is a founding partner of Slendy Gay Ellsberg. Under her leadership, women are positioned at every level of firm management, including its C-suite. The firm is also renowned for taking on industry-shaping cases and high-impact public interest work. A seasoned trial and appellate lawyer, she is recognized as a litigation star by Benchmark Litigation, one of the leading plaintiff financial lawyers in America by Law Dragon, and noted for her skill in complex commercial litigation by the Legal 500. Cranes has twice named her one of the 100 notable women in law. In addition to representing plaintiffs in high stakes disputes, Jennifer also specializes in complex defense work and is frequently tapped for sensitive internal and government, governmental investigations into antitrust financial misconduct and employment related matters. She has represented private equity and investment companies in precedent setting litigation, in addition to renewable energy companies and related interest in cutting edge litiga litigation, aimed at protecting competition and power generation for the benefit of consumers. She has also extensive expertise in RICO, bankruptcy, domestic and international arbitration, and cross borders disputes. Her public interest practices focus on poverty, women's rights, climate change and education. 
Jennifer graduated from Harvard Law School after con completing a Master's of Philosophy in International Relations at St. Anthony's College of Oxford University as a Marshall Scholar. She serves as a board chairman for the National Center for Law and Economic Justice, a national legal service organization focused on justice for the poor. She's also the co-founder and board chairman of the Speyer Legacy School, an independent school for gifted children with a special interest in low-income, high-achieving students. Jennifer is an alumna of IGL's Epic Program that looked at the militarization of the third world, and she currently serves as the vice chair of the IGL's external advisory board. She is the co-founder and CEO of the 30 Birds Foundation. We honor her this evening with the Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award in recognition for her passionate concern for and formidable dedication to human and women's rights and her inspirational commitment to evacuating the Afghan schoolgirls. Hi, my name is Ashley Jones Flores. I'm a sophomore here at Tufts. I'm majoring in international relations and civic studies. And I'm Sejal Mary Patel. I'm also a sophomore and I'm majoring in international relations and psychology. And we are the co-presidents of Tufts Women in IR, a club affiliated with the IGL. So, Medifat's high school began in 1998 as an ideal. The tenets of democracy taught in the mud, but, uh, sorry, excuse me, mud hut in a refugee camp in Pakistan. It had 30 students and young Afghan Aziz Royesh, whose vision was to build a center of academic excellence rooted in the childhood community of Kabul. Almost 25 years later, the Mutterfat High School had approximately 4,000 students, nearly half of whom were girls. Under Aziz Royesh's vision and leadership, Mutterfat became an institution renowned for empowering young Afghan women, many of whom went to study and work at the finest institutions in America, the UK, around the world, before returning to Afghanistan to take up positions in medicine, economics, law, and engineering. Then 2021 happened. With the Taliban retaking Afghanistan, the school, its students, and particularly its schoolgirls, were under threat. The Marifat school community um, came together from the ethnic Hazara minority, historically persecuted by the Taliban. In early 2021, as the U.S. began to withdraw its forces, massacres involving the Hazara people intensified. As the Taliban moved to take over areas previously controlled by the U.S. and Afghanistan, how they remained in Afghanistan, female Marifat students would have faced an unimaginable future of silence, submission, and sexually, sexual slavery under a new regime, which would exclude them from any form of education. The 30 Birds Foundation came together in July of 2021 to evacuate 450 of the most at-risk girls, the singers, performers, and athletes, some of who were already forced into hiding. Logistically, there was no way to get all 450 out together. They were split into two groups, the first 200 able to relocate to Saskatoon, to Canada, while the remaining 200 were evacuated a month later to Islamabad, where they are currently waiting for a more permanent transition. 50 of the girls in Islamabad left Afghanistan with no family members, having only the Medifat community. The goal of the 30 Birds Foundation is to reunite the whole group in Canada. The group in Pakistan is in a precarious limbo, as they could be asked to leave or be deported back to Afghanistan at any point. To move on to Canada, the foundation needs to raise $23,000 per person for them to be able to get a visa. Canada is demanding that each girl be able to show she has enough to live on for a year to gain entry and be reunited with her peers. The following video is an excerpt of a conference call with the girls in Islamabad on February 10th, 2022. Oh, she on a person, oh, never on a person, the 
um, with it, uh, 35 or 40 um, of the girls and our coordinators and uh, some of the families, and we can't fit everybody in, and we're switched into various different houses in the area. Um, but we brought to you a bunch of fantastic girls, many of whom are unaccompanied, as, as Janet said. And Christian and I thought we would just kick it off by maybe introducing you to some of the different groups that we've got here. So, and these, these girls are fantastic martial artists. And I thought they were twins. In fact, they're not. <laughs> but that's a wonderful martial artist. And then we've got, oh my gosh, where do I start? Okay, we've got our footballers here. Uh, footballers. And then we've got, let me see. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Entrepreneurs. These four here, put your hands up. They're roommates, they're planning a business together in their room together. At night, they talk about how they're going to run their own business. Now, where am I being worse with you? These brilliant, brilliant girls who really want to continue with their studies. I mean, they really, really do, which was so cruelly cut short. And we really want to be able to do that. We really, really hope that they will help you be able to do that. He is a journalist um, who was working in Afghanistan as a journalist before, um, before the Taliban came. And she is also one of our coordinators. And leaning in here, mere waves, mere waves, puts it all together and doesn't see it, basically. Yeah. But this person, yes, thank this you. This person, just this is more about a video link background. But uh, this <laughs> fantastic lady, actually, well, you tell, you tell what, what you did online here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. You go, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you this video first. Like she, she just got engaged. She got engaged to her fiancé uh, back in Kabul. So, and some of you had a party online. You, you explain. <laughs> I got engaged here uh, with a boy. <laughs> <laughs> Who is very kind, who is really kind and honest with me, thanks a lot. And we are so lucky that we have you people that you are helping us and supporting us. <laughs> so uh, I think that's that's more. They are all so accomplished, and they are all so bright and highly educated. Well, all their talents in one go. But we thought it might be nice if you heard from a few of them. Um, we might just ask them a few questions, log them into the crowd, um, just tell us a little bit about what it was like uh, when they were in Afghanistan and what the evacuation was like for them. So maybe we're going to start with our youngest, which is Neva. Yes. Neva. We have to shuffle everybody up to the front, we won't hear them. This is Neela, who's a musician who's 14. Hi everyone. And Neela, why don't you tell everybody what it was like uh, the day that Pablo fell, what it felt like to you, what was it felt like to you? First of all, I thank you all for supporting us, and helping us uh, come till now. Uh, when Pablo fell, it was scary for all of us because we had lost the chance to work for our dreams. We couldn't go to school, we couldn't go to our educational centers. And of course, as we have always said, it was so scary that we were feeling like we were in prison. We were feeling like we couldn't breathe because our rights were taken from us. Uh, actually, it's been in the four months, that, uh, five months that we are here, and uh, sometimes it feels so sad and so disappointing for us because we are losing hope somehow because uh, it takes so long that we are not in Canada now. And uh, we really hope that we can get to Canada soon because it's so sad and disappointing here that everyone is being repressed. And uh, yeah, we have nothing here. We can't go to school and we can't work for our dreams and it's not what we were born to do. And in your dreams about what your plans are, what are you thinking ahead to bring hope to your daily life for when you get into Canada? What are you hoping to study? What are you hoping your lives will be like? So uh, the most important thing that uh, I'm thinking when I'm going to date every 
night and it's almost uh, five months away. Uh, always it gives me to dream again and be hopeful that things will work out. Uh, it's uh, to pursue my master's degree in uh, Canada if I get the chance and then uh, after uh, the time period that um, Taliban are there in Afghanistan, I'm sure that one day they will leave the country or the region will be changed. So uh, I won't want to go back there in Afghanistan. I want to serve the most disadvantaged community that all these years, since 2001, uh, and I can say that the history was also dark, but uh, since 2001 to 2021, they have struggled with discrimination, and still uh, they, there were uh, several suicide attacks in uh, PG-13 that we are living there. But if we get the chance to go to Canada, so uh, we want to pursue our uh, education and then we want to serve our community. That's the most important thing that every one of us we are thinking about. I mean, we are hopeful that things will work out. You know what I'd like to ask somebody? What, what is the object? I'm just thinking, what is the object you couldn't take very much with you? The one object you could not leave behind? The one thing that was really important to you? Yeah. Yeah. Shuffleboard. Shuffleboard. Yeah. And it's just it's a business on now, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> the things that actually I brought up from Afghanistan with me is are two things. One of them is my diary, and the next one is my pain. My brother's pain. Uh, that is a special pain that my brother gave me as a symbol of uh, uh, inspiration. He gave me that. Uh, uh, that I should try all the time, never give up, no matter how tough the situation is, how hard life gets. And uh, like, it was a kind of inspiration for me that I, I should pursue my education, I, I should pursue and chase down my dreams, my goals, my aims, in any situation that I would be in the future or I, uh, like past in, in, in my past. And that is a very precious pain for me that I couldn't leave that behind myself in Afghanistan and I still have that with myself. And beside that, there's a notebook that uh, it is one of my friends gave to me. And that notebook is the thing which actually reminds me everything about my friends in Afghanistan. And I wish one day I'd be able to help them, I'd be able to do something for them, for all those girls I left behind me in Afghanistan, especially uh, Marikat High School's girls, those who are in Afghanistan still. And these two things are very precious for me. Thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Weiss and Bella and Krista. And, and uh, this is, um, wow, I, I'm trying to keep it together over here. Our hearts are with you. 150%. I just want to say that you're all so brave, and um, I hope your patience will be rewarded soon. My heart goes out to you. Can't wait to meet you all individually, and I'll give you a big virtual hug. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ria Mata. Um, I'm a junior studying international relations um, on the pre-med track. I'm from New Delhi, India, and I'm the co-president of the South Asian Regional Committee, which is um, an IGL organization. And I'm honored to be here um, to moderate this discussion with the, the two of you. You've done such incredible work. Um, I think we'll start off um, with you, um, Abazar. I would love if you could tell us a little bit about um, the inspiration for the school, how you built it, and maybe some of the biggest challenges that you faced along the way. Um, yes, yeah, so it's really great to be here. You know, I graduated from Tufts in 2016, so uh, not that long ago. Um, so it's, it's great to be here. I actually took a number of my classes from this exact room. Um, so actually the, the school that, you know, Marfat High School that we, you know, we evacuated the school girls from, it was started by my dad. He uh, founded it um, when, you know, our family moved to, Af uh, to Pakistan from Afghanistan during the first Taliban rule. Um, so back then he started the school for Afghan refugees in Pakistan. And I actually attended that school uh, when I was younger. Um, after that, you know, when, um, after 9-11, when US came to Afghanistan, 
um, the school, uh, my, my dad moved the school to Afghanistan, basically because back then, you know, that was a hope for a new Afghanistan, you know, and um, I, I was back then, I was um, towards the end of middle school, uh, and, and so I also joined the school. Um, uh, the school, you know, as, as, as uh, was mentioned here, uh, basically stood for the ideals of democracy, women's rights, human rights, um, and, you know, uh, by last year, the school had grown to 4,000 students. Half of them were girls. Um, overall, the you know the inspiration. I, I, I mean, I asked my dad this question often. You know, what was the inspiration before, behind his work? Um, I think that you know he has always been an educator. Even when the Soviet rule, uh, when the Soviets were controlling Afghanistan, you know he was an educator. He used to smuggle books with him from Pakistan to Afghanistan, basically to teach some of the um, the, the boys in our village. Uh, and then after that, you know he um, when he got a chance, he basically self-taught himself, you know, how to read and write. You he only has a formal education until fifth grade, but he still like you know. Started started uh, Marfat High School initially for refugees in Pakistan and then moved it to Afghanistan. So I think for him it was just this hope that, you know, the war would not last in Afghanistan for a long time, that we could dream, that we could hope to build a better Afghanistan. Um, again, you know, I think over the past 20 years, um, Marfat High School was a beacon of hope. It was a beacon of uh, development of, you know, uh, modernization in Afghanistan and you know I went to that school that's how I made my way to Tufts um, and you know for a lot of students who did go to Marifat that was basically for them it allowed them to dream differently to live a different life um, and so I think you know I wish that my dad were here or one of the students because they could have definitely spoken more about this but I think you know um, I say this with a lot of um, pride but also a lot of pain because you know for 20 years as i mentioned it was a beacon of hope but not anymore unfortunately because of what the events of last year uh, but again i think that you know the impact that the school had and this new generation of afghans that it it did um, raise have left their mark and you know we can still hope for a better afghanistan going forward that's really powerful thank you so much um, I'd like to go over to you, Jennifer. Um, we'd love to hear a little bit about your story. How did you get involved with uh, 30 Birds? What inspired you when you, when you got the, the email to, to get involved? So Heather mentioned that I'm on the advisory board and the alumni, we stay very connected. Um, at the moment that this email came through, I had been dwelling for some time on what was happening in Afghanistan. I mean, I think, you know, I did not, after graduating from here in international relations and doing my master's degree, I, I ended up going to law school and some of my work is international, but not all of it. Um, but what I took away from Tufts was this profound obligation to be informed, to know, um, to ask questions and to think critically about what's going on in the world and not just to be a citizen of our country, but to be a global citizen. And, you know, so Afghanistan was on my mind. And in particular, there were two events that just were so impactful for me. One, they were both in May of 2021. And one of them, it's just, it's hard to speak about. It's unspeakably horrible. Um, that the Taliban massacred young mothers and their babies in a hospital, in a maternity ward um, in this community. The Hazara, um, as the Americans were making it clear that they were leaving, there was a veil of protection that was taken away from these people that they had had. And women were immediately targeted. Subsequently, there was a bombing at a school and it was timed for the afternoon when the girls attended school. So there was this attack not only on um, a persecuted minority, but on, on women and on their right to be educated. And I was thinking, um, many of my friends who are involved in government and whatnot, and I was talking, and no, there was no urgency to the American, the sense that we were going to protect the people that we were leaving behind. I mean it's played out that way, that there was a horrible 
um, catastrophe that's happened and the way the withdrawal occurred and the lack of planning for evacuation. And I just had a sense of that. So there was just this feeling that I, I had no time. I was overcommitted already in a very busy um, job. But it was one of those times that I think, you know, if you have where you cannot say no. I, it was just so inspiring me to um, do what I could to help this group get these girls to safety. Because when you save them, I was just talking about this with somebody earlier, I think it was Abby, um, President Zelensky in the Ukraine, he exists because one of his ancestors survived the Holocaust. And when you save somebody, when they survive, you're saving a generation, you're saving their offspring, the future of Afghanistan. And these girls had seized education. They understood how valuable it was. They were the top performing high school in Afghanistan. And so to me, there was no way I could say no. That's really amazing. And yeah, there's lots, so many parallels to be drawn between what's happening today in Ukraine and, and what happened in Afghanistan. So thank you for that. Um, and I'd like to go back to uh, you, Abazar, um, and just was wondering if you could talk us through the evacuation. Um, how did it happen? Uh, what kind of tools did you use? How did you utilize the network? What were some of the biggest challenges? Things like that. Um, so the evacuation first began uh, when, you know, as provinces were falling to the Taliban, I was thinking about what would happen to my family initially. Um, because, you know, as I mentioned, my father, he was the founder of Marifat School. And, you know, because of, you know, Marifat's uh, image in the community, it was also a prime target for the Taliban, but also uh, other extremist elements in the, in the community. In fact, actually, the school was attacked in 2009, but some of the more fundamentalist um, elements in, the, in, in, in Kabul. Uh, so back then, you know, for me it was how can I save my family? And so, uh, in the beginning, I reached out to some friends of my dad who were also supporters of for supporters of the school. You guys met Bell and Krista uh, in the video, and so she, them, for example, there is also a few other uh, friends of mine, personal friends of mine. I asked them for help, and basically, the first um, three days after Kabul fell, four days after Kabul fell basically were non-stop sleepless trying to get my family out. When um, the day that Kabul fell, actually what happened was, um, so nobody could ex uh, uh, had, you know, anticipated that Kabul will fall so quickly. Um, but, you know, actually that day, two of my sisters, they were at the Indian embassy, they were trying to get their visas uh, so that they could get on a flight out, out of the country. My dad and the rest of my family, they did not have passports, so they were at that passport office trying to do their biometrics so they, they could collect their passports. And what they said was, you know, it was around midday in Kabul when uh, President Ashrafani fled the country. And when that, when that news spread, basically everybody in the government offices, they um, left the, the offices and went, went back, basically changed into like the Afghan traditional clothes and went back home. And so from then on, you know, my family, they actually, uh, decided not to go back home uh, anymore because it was too dangerous for them. So they actually went to stay in a safe house um, that was owned by one of my dad's friends. Um, and they stayed in that safe house for four or four days uh, until we, you know, could get them out of the country. During those four days, um, basically, you know, we in the U.S., you know, the, the group that I mentioned, we tried every door, like, reached out to anybody we could, you know, desperately. In those days, um, basically all we had was like, we were on a Zoom call 24-7, you know, sending hundreds, if not thousands of messages a day, uh, trying to get on a call with anybody, anybody that we thought could help. You know, this ranged from people at the State Department, at the Department of Defense, uh, uh, you know, other countries, for example, people inside Afghanistan that we thought could find a way. Um, and so, um, during this time, you know, we were connected to people, for example, the Marines who were manning the gates at the Kabul airport because Kabul airport was the only way that they could get out. Um, we connected to people at the State Department who were drafting up the list of people who would be evacuated from Afghanistan. We were uh, talking to people at the De Defense Department who were actually operating the flights that were leaving out of Kabul airport. And so back then, you know, basically trying through all of these mechanisms, you know, however we could, 
just try to, 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 to help my family get out. And luckily on the fourth day, actually lar in large part due to my family and especially my sister who actually was there with my family and she um, you know, uh, managed to get them into Kabul airport and they, then they sat on a flight to Qatar and then from there to Germany and then to the US. Um, but after, you know, after that was done, basically the whole group, we were the group of eight people at that time who evacuated my family. Uh, we, we, after those four days, we sat and we were like, so now what? You know, like, yes, we've managed to help my family, but what about thousands of people who are left behind, you know, especially the most vulnerable, which are some of the girls that you met. So then we decided to help the second group. And uh, that's when, you know, when I reached out to the IGL community, because back then we had no plan, no money, not a lot of connections. And also this was when the U.S. had already uh, left, you know, the, the, the evacuation mission had already ended. And so we, you know, basically back then tried from scratch, basically how, like finding a way to, to get the group out. Um, and then over the next, you know, few months, and Jennifer can talk a little bit about this, uh, because that's when she got involved. Um, we tried basically knocked at every door that was open to us. You know, we tried um, talking to people to get the girls over land to, for example, Tajikistan, to Uzbekistan, trying to get them to Pakistan, trying to get them out of a flight, um, out of Kabul airport, out of, for example, Mazar, which is the city in the north. At one point, you know, we, <laughs> we were talking to people who were trying to uh, airlift them out of Afghanistan. They, they proposed that we buy a plane, land it in an air, airstrip controlled by the Taliban, and then, you know, to, to get the girls into safe houses and then put them on these flights out of the country. We actually, I mean, Jennifer was um, looking at that option for a few weeks, actually before we decided that we, it was too risky and we couldn't go through with that. We chartered another plane out of this city in northern Afghanistan, uh, trying to get the girls out, but you know, uh, we moved the whole group to, to the north. Um, and this was large part, you know, organized by the girls themselves because they were the ones who had the most updated intel. Um, they had to, you know, basically go past like 15 Taliban checkpoints, you know, over, in, in this like 12 grueling hours journey from Kabul to the north. Um, they stayed there for two weeks, but then that plan also fell apart because Taliban were not letting any of the charter flights uh, leave, leave Mazar. So then, you know, we got them back to Kabul, you know, asked them to go over land to Pakistan, and that's how we managed to get the first group out. Again, this is an extraordinary story, and I think that Jennifer would, can share a little bit more of the details, but to me, now looking back, it, it just seems like we were um, trying to like put down fires. It, it just feels like absolutely surreal of what happened in, during those few months uh, until we managed to get, get the group to safety. The only thing I would add is that it is essential to understand how important it was that we had young Afghan expats who knew these girls, who knew these, this community, because the trust that it took. I mean, we were concerned. They had to go through these 15 checkpoints. We learned from several independent sources that somebody on a bus to Mazar had been um, stopped by the Taliban and found to have Western contacts in their phone and had been shot on the spot. So we had to help them make sure that they were not carrying you know, cell phones that had any Western contacts. We were communicating over WhatsApp um, and listening to what they were saying about what was going on. So having people that they trusted from the Marifat community um, giving them this opportunity, but also never promising them that it was going to succeed. That was the thing, the bravery of these girls in the face of we're saying, look, we don't know for sure that this flight will take off. We, you know, here's what we know. Here's what we're trying to do. You have to make a decision. Will you make this journey? That was true on the trip to Mazar. It was true when we, we had temporary visas from Pakistan for them to go overland through the Turkum gate, um, which, you know, was filled with people trying to get across the border. Um, they had to go through Taliban checkpoints. Women could not travel alone. Um, they had to be very, very careful. Um, again, they had to make the decision, am I going to pack up a knapsack and 
leave this life, the only life that I've ever known, to go to Pakistan on a temporary visa in case Abuzar and his family and friends might be able to get us a visa into Canada. I mean, that's the kind of decision that these girls had to make and that they put their trust in us, I think energized us because it was an exhaust, it's been an exhausting seven months. Um, but to see their hope and the trust that they put in us, I mean, you saw those girls, okay? That's what motivates us, that we, we have um, all this hope and all this potential for the future. Um, and they made the decision. When the first group got to Sask Saskatoon, they were coming on, on flights um, to Canada. The Canadians really processed them in Islamabad. And Justin Hefter, our, one of our teammates, and I went to Saskatoon to meet them. And there were these names that I had seen, these people who were the coordinators, okay? They were organizing the groups that would make their way to the gate, getting the paperwork, making sure people were safe, making sure only encrypted communications, right? And these girls walk off the plane and they're 20 years old, they're 22 years old. They organize 200 people safely out of Afghanistan. And it was stunning to me, right? So, you know, this is about the power of um, very young people coming together to do something like that. You know, I'm one of the old ones. Like, we've got a, a few elderly folks, right? And Krista and Bella and me, right? And it's a bunch of very, very young people um, who are giving of themselves um, to save their community members. Wow, that's just a harrowing and um, incredible tale. And um, I think your perseverance and just relentless commitment to these girls is an inspiration to us all. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, I think now we'll uh, open it up to questions from the audience. Um, if anyone um, has anything they'd like to ask uh, Abuzar or Jennifer. Primarily at this point, we are we are fundraising. I mean, it is a, um, you know, sort of both a wonderful thing that Canada will take uh, refugees who are privately sponsored. I mean, we don't do that here in the United States. Um, but it's also a horrible thing because there's a dollar value that's put on every one of those girls. Um, and, you know, we have been very lucky um, to have some very generous support. Um, we have a matching grant right now of up to a million dollars. We have a donor who will match donations up to a million dollars um, by the end of March. And we are filling out the paperwork. So there's a process of um, getting the girls to tell their story, to, to fill out paperwork that gets submitted through an agency in Canada. And once it's decided upon, um, we, we will place money in trust for them and it will be administered to them to support them in their first year. But as, as long as we get to our, our target goal, we will move another 200, um, hopefully in the coming months, from Islamabad to Saskatoon to reunite with their, their Marifat schoolmates there. Can, can, I, can I grab the mic? Um, thanks for speaking with us today. I was wondering if you guys are still in contact with the girls who are currently in Canada. Um, maybe if you could like little, talk a little bit about how they're sort of adjusting um, to the new lives and like their status. I mean, I can start, but Jennifer also met them in person, so she can talk a little bit more. Uh, yes, so we are in touch with the girls in, in, in Canada as well. Um, to be honest, you know, they are members of the same community, and they've really settled in well in Saskatoon. Uh, and the community has also really opened their arms to them. Um, some of them already work with, the, for example, the office of the mayor. Some of them already work helping other refugees uh, that are coming to Canada, basically we resettle in these communities. Um, a lot of the girls have started school again, um, and they're, you know, uh, learning how to skate, they're learning how to survive in the cold, but also, <laughs> um, they're also, you know, um, making new friends, uh, a lot of them, and, and, and their adjustment has been, uh, for us, 
incredible because you know you can imagine like the 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 trauma that they endured when they were in Afghanistan but to be honest it's been almost seamless for them you know to integrate into this new community to already be taking initiatives for example they are you know organizing a festival to celebrate the new year with their new community members um They've already, each of them, you know, have made a lot of friends. Um, they, you know, we had um, people, for example, from one of the, the largest, uh, a reporter from the largest TV network in Canada went and interviewed them. Um, and, and then they, you know, spoke about their journey. They spoke about how they're resettling and what, what you know, how their experience has been. Um, but yeah, they, it's been uh, beyond belief because, you know, you'd imagine uh, that these girls, um, not just because of the experiences they've had, but also, um, what they've been through and how much they've left behind, um, how difficult it must have been for them. But you know they're full of resilience. They're full of life. And I mean, Jennifer met them in person, so she can she can talk 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 about that. Um, you know, I there's a stunning image that stays in my mind of um, I believe she may have been your niece, um, a girl wearing you know the the motto of the Washington Post is democracy dies in darkness. And seeing this little girl wearing that t-shirt proudly was so moving to me. Um, but the other thing about this interview, you know, some of the news coverage of them, they talked to some of the teachers at the local school where these children are now enrolled. And the teachers talked about the way the level of education has already been impacted and raised because of what voracious learners these girls are. They do not take for granted the right to an education. Um, and they're so excited about it. So they're really enriching the community, learning to skate and toboggan and, you know, enjoy winter sports among other things. So it's, it's incredible. Um, so one of the things I wanted to ask about was um, there are some people who say that the Taliban of 1996 and of 2001 was very different, much worse than, you know, in their progressive, in terms of their regressive policies than today. And I was wondering, since you have lived that example, I mean, sorry, you've lived that life, you've been in Afghanistan while the Taliban came to power. Do you think that there is hope that the Taliban today might be more open for women to get an education and to get, um, and just generally have more progressive policies, policies in that regard? So that's a very difficult question to answer for me. And part of the reason is that uh, I'd like to offer the caveat that, you know, I was one of the people who didn't think that Afghanistan would fall so quickly to the Taliban because, you know, just, I think that, you know, um, I had been uh, a student at Marifat, and you know Marifat had created this sort of a, a community that was supportive of all of its members. Um, and I did not foresee it, you know, that Taliban had such a widespread reach, in, especially in rural areas, but also in major cities, and you know, even in the government ranks. So because of that, you know, <laughs> I might not be the best person to you know comment on what what the Taliban would do. Uh, from experience. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of the policies that Taliban have now taken don't seem to be very different than their policies in the 1990s. Um, especially, you know, one of the things that helps now is that they are looking for international recognition. But, you know, if they do not get to that international recognition that they need and, and the money that they need, uh, you never know what, what, what happens. From what, you know, for example, we see now, you know, girls' education is largely still banned, for, especially for older girls, for example. Um, they, you know, the girls still cannot, you know, leave their homes without, um, a, uh, you know, male companion, for example. Um, you know, they, you know, in the first days when they took office, when you know a lot of female employees of the government, when they went to take their positions, they were sent back home. So a lot, unfortunately, a lot of the early signs don't seem to be um, different than than what was the case. But again, you know. Um, I'm just being a, a bit of an optimist that I, I really hope, and I, I think that Afghans are very resilient people. You know, there are plenty of people inside Afghanistan who do not have the same views as the Taliban. And I think that, you know, just knowing how resilient people are and how strong they are, I think that the country will move forward, but at what pace? I uh, unfortunately cannot comment on that. I think if you look at what, um policies have been put in place and I mean we just we hear things all the time in particular people asking us for help who we mostly cannot help 
Um, the Taliban goes door to door. It murders uh, women who served in the government previously. Um, they're rooting out safe houses where women are hiding. They're banning women from travel. Uh, they shut down the schools. Um, it, whether that's as bad, I mean, they're announcing in the mosques that um, young girls who are unmarried um, may be married off to Taliban soldiers. Um, it doesn't feel like a different Taliban, although on the other hand, we've also heard that they, they are not unified. There are many different Talibans, right? And they don't all get along. Um, so is, is there hope for a more moderate uh, leadership in Afghanistan? I think that um, time will tell. But right now, the extreme uh, economic circumstances are, are unlikely to bring out the best in them. If the international community is willing to um, help Afghan citizens, you know, that may be perceived as strengthening the Taliban, but it would also potentially give some leverage for them to lessen some of their more extreme human rights abuses. Thank you so much for that perspective. I think it's a really important one and a really valuable one for us to have, especially when so many in this country, I think, um, have tried to wipe their hands of, of Afghan blood by, by saying that it's different this time. Um, so it's a really valuable perspective to have. So thank you so much. Um, um, excuse me, sorry. I was wondering what, um, what do you think was the biggest challenge of this entire process, logistically speaking? Um, if you could shed some light on that, that would be great. I think that, you know, this uh, whole evacuation, even though we spoke about it very briefly, it was challenging on many levels. Um, the first of all is just the trauma, uh, not, you know, not only on us, but, you know, on the people who actually went through the experience. Um, on the logistical side, you know, uh, just the limited intelligence that we were getting in terms of like knowing what was about to happen, you know, that made things extremely difficult. Uh, one of the examples of this, and today we talked about it briefly, was um, initially we had, um, there was a period when we thought that we could get people on buses into Kabul airport and then, uh, because we had heard that there were flights, that if they got into the airport, they could sit on flights. Um, and we had actually organized buses to go into the Kabul airport. And at that moment, uh, the, our partner who was organizing the buses, they received calls from somebody on the ground in Afghanistan, you know, one of their coordinators, who said that something felt off, that they didn't know what it was. They were like, you guys make a decision, but something feels off on the ground. And to us, you know, I mean, I was sitting in California, like, how can I make a decision about the lives of these people who are sitting on these buses waiting to, to go into the airport? And, you know... Um, our partner and, you know, Justin, one of our colleagues, they ultimately decided to call off the evacuation plan, basically call off the buses. And 15 minutes later, the bombing at the Abbey Gate in Kabul airport happened. So, you know, in, in that situation, basically, how were we to know what was about to happen, you know, in, in, in Kabul airport? And this was not just one incident. Basically, all along the way, uh, for example, Jennifer mentioned about the case of um, the incident that we had heard between Kabul and Mazar, you know, that at, the, at one of the Taliban checkpoints, somebody who had um, American affiliation had been shot. Um, you know, we basically conveyed that information to the girls who were saying, you know, this is all we know. And even if you get to Mazar, we really cannot promise you that the flight will take off. You guys need to make that decision. And, and, and I think that was like the, the challenge there, right? Because we just had such limited information of what was actually happening on the ground. Um, it's, so we had to trust, basically, the, 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 the intuition of these girls, basically, so that they could you know, make decisions on life and death. Yeah. Uh, for me, hands down, the absolute, and, and this is not really a logistical issue, but it, it relates to the fact that we, we were just constantly making lists for the, for the Canadians, for the Pakistanis, for the Americans, for the Ecuadorans. We had to make lists. And that meant deciding who would get on the list and who wouldn't. And there are still Marifat girls in Kabul who need to, who need to be evacuated. I mean, they, they wanted to be on the list. 
And we were constantly making these judgments about who is more at risk, who is the most vulnerable, and then who got out and who didn't. You saw on the video, the gentleman is introduced as a coordinator, Amir Weiss. He's a journalist. He was on our first list. Everyone on our first list, except for Mayor Weiss, is in Canada right now. He volunteered to stay behind to help out with the second group and to accept the uncertainty that went with that. And he is, I mean, to me, he is, he is her heroic because the girls couldn't travel without, we had to have men in the group. We had to have men who were willing to accompany them, who also look out for them now in Pakistan where they are vulnerable. Um, so it's those choices, those, you know, who gets on the list. I found it unbelievably taxing and difficult to participate in those decisions. Sure thing. Um, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, uh, does the Taliban go after the families of the people who've uh, been able to escape? Uh, I know in North Korea that for a defector family, um, they're all punished by the North Korean government. And I was wondering if that was the same for Afghanistan. I don't think that we've seen any specific examples. Um, they are, they're not totally organized, they're not totally in control of the country yet. We have not been able to make, we were talking this about this today at lunch with one of our, our partners. Um, they are going after some people that where it makes perfect sense, it's logical. They were women and, and men who worked in for the Americans and in the government. Um, and they're not going after some people that we would expect them to. And, and I don't know if that's just a logistical issue for them, an organizational issue, or kind of what's driving it, or, or if it's different factions making different choices. We believe that the recent lockdown on people leaving the country, and particularly women leaving the country, um, is, is in reaction to the overwhelming numbers of people who have been heading for the borders. Um, hi. So, given how like great of an impact the schools had in the past, uh, in the future down the road, do you hope to reinstate the school, perhaps again in Pakistan or in a different country, for Afghan refugees again? So, I've had the conversation with my dad, you know, about his plans, and he is still involved with the community because, you know, I mean, this is the community that he nurtured for the past, you know, twenty years. Um, the hope. You know, I, I don't think his hope is to reinstate another school for refugees, but rather to help both girls who got out and those who didn't through educational programs, whatever that might look like. Um, especially, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, girls who like resettled in Canada, they're already in, uh, enrolled in schools and they, you know, the, it's not best for them to be still an isolated community in Canada, right? It's, it's better for them to integrate into the local community and, and or, you know, for example, go to the local schools. But, you know, besides that, there can be programming for their, you know, skills trainings, there can be um, uh, empowerment programs for them, leadership programs. Um, for those inside the country, you know, there's, uh, like I've, I've had this conversation with my dad and I don't think he's give up, give, giving up hope that, you know, there will still be ways that you can educate those who are left behind because, you know, right now it doesn't seem like a lot of them have access to education and he is trying to work on that. And this is actually one of the things that, you know, 30 Birds, it's just been, you know, We've, we've been dealing with emergencies like basically every, every day of the month. We've never had a chance to sit back and think about, you know, strategically about what we can do to, to help, you know, those outside but also those inside. But it is also a part of our, the, the, the mission of the foundation to help educational, with educational opportunities for those who are outside the country but also those inside so that, you know, the Marifat community that, you know, basically nurtured in Afghanistan can still stay together and you know, become basically change makers in their local communities, but also in Afghanistan going forward. And uh, the other thing that we shouldn't forget about is that Marifat was a co-ed school. 
And there are still Hazara boys who are able to be educated. And that is not a, that's not a small thing, right? That's a big thing. When you think about generations of Hazara who were denied equal opportunities, right? So the school still serves a very important role in the community. Um, and, you know, once we can stop drinking from a fire hose, my hope is that we can also find ways to reach girls um, that are left behind in Afghanistan. You just mentioned a bit about this, but I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about what life is like now for the girls who are still in Afghanistan and how their daily lives have been shaped and how their families have um, had to adapt to the entire situation. I'm, I'm going to I, I, I'm going to tell a, a story in response to that I, it's not really um, uh, it's not really a direct answer but um, I recently had the opportunity to have dinner with um, the sister of one of the girls who is in Canada and the sister got out as Kabul was falling because she was a sophomore in college. Um, in New York and at a school in St Staten Island. She's studying chemical or chemistry and or chemical engineering. And she described to me the feeling of being a girl, a woman, a young woman who had had the hope that comes from education and from going to the Marifat school and having dreams about her future. And she said that she was telling her father that she would rather die than give that up. She would rather be dead than live under the Taliban where they took that from her. And her father, having lived uh, many years longer, having lived through the Soviet occupation, um, having felt exactly that way when he was young, he, he told her, um, but also because he was her father said, you have to understand, you don't have the perspective now, but there's something in just living. There's something valuable to just stay alive because things can change. Because in the long game, there is hope. So I understand why you feel that way, but there is hope in the long run if you can just survive. And for a father to have to say that to a daughter, you know, it's, it's just so poignant to me. But it really captured for me what, is, what does it feel like for those girls who are left behind. And hopefully they have fathers who are saying that to them, who are saying, don't give up hope because there's a long game here and things can change. And don't feel like you, you, that you want to die. Um, that was a beautiful story. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And I think, uh, with, uh, I think this is probably our last question that we uh, are going to have time for tonight. So, yeah. Um, thank you both for sharing and reflecting, and all of your hard work um, for the evacuation. Um, my name is Lauren. I actually work in a refugee resettlement organization here in Boston, and we've received um, 200 Afghan refugees. And so I'm kind of wondering, to inform my own work, um, what kind of structures are in place in Canada or um, currently in Pakistan to support um, evacuees? Um, and I, a lot of my work is in women's empowerment, which seems very like central to your work as well. So what kind of, kind of women's empowerment thinking or programs or structures um, can continue for girls after evacuation? Um, when it comes to Pakistan, unfortunately, there are not that many resources because also um, Pakistan is being overwhelmed by the number of Afghan refugees who are going there. Um, and also, you know, the country does not have sufficient resources to resettle and they're not even planning on resettlement uh, or, or to like integrate them into the community or even allow them some of the basic necessities like, you know, um, even, uh, you know, provide them with food or sh shelter or, for example, um, some sort of an opportunity to get an education. Uh, in Canada, the situation is different. The Canadian government has um, a pretty robust support system for the for refugees. For example, you know we discussed the private sponsorship. That's why we need to raise money uh, for these girls. Um, 
that money that you know we as that we would pay for that private sponsorship that is the money that goes directly to supporting each of these girls in Canada once they land the Canadian government you know they've also introduced that they would uh, that they're taking uh, refugees through these gov government assisted programs as well in which case you know the Canadian government is going to be supporting them not just for the first year but uh, after that uh, and that support is pretty inclusive you know of pretty comprehensive you know it includes education healthcare um, skills training for those who are a little older um, but also you know um, basically like housing food shelter all of that um, I think that for you know the refugees that are coming to the U.S., unfortunately, the U.S. Um, system is not as supportive of uh, as that in in, in uh, Canada. And I know that because my family, you know, they resettled in Virginia. There, you know, they they were at a military camp until um, October when they you know when they got out of the camp and they uh, we basically had to help them find a place. We had to you know uh, help them uh, get the school the girls into schools, etc. Um, even though the, 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 the U.S. has a limited support available, for example, with regards to, you know, covering the cost of rent and food and utilities for the first three months, that's not enough time for a refugee to resettle, you know, somebody who's left behind everything uh, to resettle in a new country. And, and to that end, you know, I think educational programs um, and skills trainings I believe are the, the, some of the most important because, you know, it's not just about opening your doors and then forgetting about these people who are coming in, but rather, you know, giving them the platform on which they can build their future as they can, you know, become good citizens of, you know, U.S. or Canada or whoever, wherever they are. I want to give credit here to Ebizar's wife, Tahera, um, was a journalist in Afghanistan and has been instrumental in working with me and, and other members of our team to advocate for the support of the girls, particularly on the ground in Islamabad, whereas um, where Abuzar says, you know, there just is no support and they're very vulnerable. So the things that we've been working on, we've found Dari speaking therapists to do some telehealth um, group therapies with the girls. Um, the doctors on the ground, uh, it's very hard uh, to, for them because they risk their licenses and the demand there is so overwhelming right now with all the refugees. It was just taking us too long. So we went this route of the telehealth. Um, for me, uh, you know, I'm going over to Pakistan next week, listening to them, talking to them. My son and his um, high school friends um, have offered to become pen pals, you know, to, to have Zoom meetings, to, um, you know, to connect with their peers, similar age peers um, here in the U.S., um, to let, let them know how, that there are people who will welcome them, who feel, um, who admire them, who respect their bravery. Um, and who, you know, want to see them succeed and, and come to Canada. Um, just being able to get them access to some programming. Um, we have a programming, I guess, a, a writing program that we're putting in place for them. We're, you know, as we've been able to raise funds, creating the opportunity for um, potential educational programs, short-term educational programs. So we've been creating the the support network for them there and i think the coordinators themselves there are some just incredibly committed resilient members of this community who are there for the others you know and for those when they fall down when they feel lowest um we we've tried to encourage them we've tried to listen to them i mean i'm taking over you know four old laptops and um we're going to get some, we've decided that we're going to introduce board games and try to find some some activities that they can do communally just until we get this paperwork done and we can get them to Canada. But, you know, it's, it's a challenge. Thank you both for those um, wonderful and pointed answers and for all the work that you have done. I think I speak for everyone when I say that um, we're all truly inspired. Um, I think with that, we're going to end our uh, moderated discussion. Um, but um, if everyone could give these two one more round of applause. Thank you very much.